Thanks for coming and joining us. Um, I wanted to echo Mari's um, getting involved with the Headlands, the sh because I, I love the Headlands. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Cheers to the Headlands real quick. <laughs> um, I moved here from New York one year ago and uh, I felt like I always heard so much about the Headlands from, honestly, so many artists I've worked with. I feel like I owe so much to the Headlands for providing that space to allow them to do, you know, kind of go inside their brains and come up with the crazy ideas that they did that we produced at the new museum. <laughs> and I'm just so lucky to be here and to be part of this community. Um, and when I arrived here uh, to take this position as chief creator at Berkeley Art Museum, um, I visited here like right away um, because of how much I, 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 I heard about it from so many artists and it really is such a like magical place and, and I just wanted to start with that because I also feel it's incredibly special to allow artists the opportunity to do something new. Artists change. Artists don't often stay the same. They need to change, and we need to support them to allow that to happen. Um, and to also push their practices in ways that might sometimes be scary and risk-taking. Um, and I just wanted to start with that shout out. Um, and I also heard that Pia was coming. And that <laughs> made me so excited because uh, Pia and I are very close friends. <laughs> And we worked together on a show at New Museum in 2016 that I feel like was a very formative show for both of us. Um, and we'll kind of talk about that uh, in the middle of this uh, uh, talk. Um, so we're just a little housekeeping. We'll speak for about 45 minutes or so and then open it up to some questions. Um, but we wanted to start actually just speaking about what Pat Pia is doing here, and then to go backwards a little bit. Um, and so this is an image of a performance that Pia actually did quite recently um, here uh, in San Francisco. Yeah, at the San Francisco Book Fair. So I presented the monograph that you saw at the entrance. It's, it's, uh, it just uh, came out with um, Inventory Press, is the, the, the publishing house. And so we presented it at the fair, and I thought it'd be really nice to do something different and fun, and so I did a lip sync of Peggy Lee's song, Is That All There Is? Because I felt like it really represented where I'm at at this point. And just this message, I don't know if you're familiar with the song, but it's a very fun song. It's very like cabaret inspired. And basically, after a series of disasters, she says, she comes to this conclusion, is that all there is, then let's keep dancing. So I um, presented the, the book in that context, and it was very fun. And we'll speak a little bit about that book at the end yeah. as well, because it is, I think, yeah, uh, really interesting to think about this song in that, in that context. And yeah and kind of where you are at this point as well, you know? Sure. Yeah. And where we all are, you know, kind of mm -hmm. that idea to keep dancing uh, despite all the horrors that are going on around us. Yeah. Um, which we feel very present right now. Um, and so actually, if we could move to the next image, this is your sneak peek um, <laughs> of what's going on in the studio. And, um, it is interesting because when um, I saw these images, I am actually immediately started thinking about some of Pia's earliest work, which we'll speak about a little bit later. Um, but it's quite a departure from, I think, what Pia's work is more well known for. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to offer this opportunity to talk a little bit about these paintings and what this space and this opportunity has kind of led to. Yeah, so I, I trained as a painter. I did my undergrad in painting, and I did uh, probably my entire youth. I did um, life drawing. I was totally enamored with the body, and since I was like probably 12 years old, I just did life drawing classes. Um, and, and, then, and then I spent half of my life trying to you know, 
come, come out of painting or like try to deconstruct painting. Um, so my opportunity here in the headlands to, to, go, to, to start painting again has been such a joy and I'm very happy to have this space and time to be doing that. And um, yeah, as Margot says, it's not what I'm usually known for, but it's, uh, I think it's definitely a uh, departure and, and I'm very, uh, it's been incredible to, like Margot was just at my studio right now and we were talking about how um, some themes that we will discuss later in this talk like um, the idea of desire, that the desire plays in my work or how I you know, uh, approach desire is something that's probably represented in the works but in a, through a more like um, subjective or like um, fantasy aspect which is something you can't do with the other work I was doing so it's just nice to have the space and the time here to be doing this kind of ex new explorations. Would you talk a little bit about the backdrop? Yeah, so the idea is they're gonna be hung. These are paintings that are about, I don't do feet or inches, but they're about a meter uh, and a half tall. They're big. <laughs> yeah, they're like this. And uh, it's about 10 paintings that I'm hoping to hang in a dark space that's gonna be like spot lit. Each painting's gonna be spot lit, like very, kind of theatrical or dramatic and the backdrop I'm hoping to do it um, kind of what you see there in, in sort of this galaxy environment and it's going to be done kind of very uh, not sloppy but kind of very what you see in the background is really me spray pen painting into like a, a black sheet so that's eventually what I'm going to do in the space it's kind of a large gallery it's Omar gallery in Mexico City um, and, and the idea is that it's done in this very sort of like, uh, yeah, sort of fast way. It won't be very detailed. And the paintings will be hanging on top of it. One of the things that I, I thought a lot about when seeing these works were like, some, so we're, we're gonna get to this at the very end, but uh, Pia recently had this major exhibition that was like a kind of mid-career survey show. Um, in Mexico City. And it started off with all of these collages that were from the time when you were in a band and um, making these flyers for, for the band, for the performances that you did. Um, and especially like in relationship to the makeup and how you were, um, yeah, there's this interesting way that like that idea of that makeup has persisted like in these works too. Um, and something that you are exploring there in terms of also, I mean, you talked about desire and I think desire also, you know, is very much in relationship to what a lot of your previous work has also been talking about, which is consumer desire. Um, and I do think that the way that makeup is applied in these instances also some kind of plays into that idea too in terms of like what is desire what are, what is paint what what are we what are we working with here um, what are we masking what are we celebrating what are we uh, trying to hide away um, and it reminded me a lot of the the early works too yeah that is true they are a little th theatrical the the idea with desire is that I that I'm drawn to is that it it's always disobedient, um, and it's in it, in commodity culture I think it's it tends to even though we're like you know trained to you know kind of commodify to the norm it it's always has this sort of subversive thing to it that I'm I'm drawn to and I think um, in these specific images it's taking it towards the fantasy side of it, I think it's important, but um, should we move on and yeah, yeah, show other images? Yeah, so now we're going back to, what year is this? This is, um, so I wasn't a mom yet. And that's like my, my <laughs> parameter, because <laughs> I have really bad memory, but this is 2009, I think. This is uh, one of the first projects of yours that I feel like I, I knew. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, I think it, it's interesting because, yeah, you were still in this band at this point and... Yeah, doing... I was in the band and also I didn't have a gallery. Um, I wasn't that young, like, so 2009, I was 29 years old, but I, I wasn't, I didn't have any gallery representation. Um, I'm from Mexico City and, and born and raised there, but um, when I came back, uh, a friend let me occupy her studio space, which was at the top of this old modernist building, building in downtown Mexico City, which is a very, if you've been to downtown Mexico, it's a very insane place. And it's uh, filled with this type of like banners for selling things. And so I, I did this, those letters are sewn into the fabric and it was really long and I decided that every time I would go into the studio to work, I would just put the banner out. So I did a series of different actions and um, wrote a couple of songs and a script with a, a friend a author at the time, he's Hungarian, Peter Silahi. Um, and we, we sort of did this whole thing that eventually turned out into be like open studios where my friends could come in and you know, I would play for them or do different type of things. Um, and besides just being in that area, of downtown mm -hmm. Mexico City and how commercial, the, you know, the, the the landscape was. What was it about going to the studio and offering yourself for sale? Yeah, it was just a kind of a funny, uh, yeah, g gesture to say, you know, I'm gonna if I'm if I'm not in, you know, if I don't have the representation, I might as well just do that for myself. <laughs> so in a way, it was like positioning the artist in sort of, uh, you know, and also acknowledging that you somehow become a commodity, so being at the center of it. So what I didn't say is that, or it's probably very obvious, but the other side of the banner is um, strapped to me. So I'm like, it's like a Superman cape. <laughs> and it would just blow with the wind and be very dramatic. But it's, yeah, I was trying to position myself um, in, 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 in a space and generate my own sort of um, set of rules and space and community around my work. Um, and so, the, yeah, I did that for a few months. And then, uh, if we can go to the next image, I feel like this relates a lot to this piece. Yeah. So this is No A Trio A. Yeah, so it's a, a play on the title of Yvonne Reiner, um, Yvonne Reiner's piece, uh, the, no, well, her piece is called Trio A, Trio A. Um, and I did a remake of it, uh, dressed, as you see me, with, uh, I collaborated with a friend, he's a fashion designer, Uriel Urban. He's really into bondage, and I told him um, it'd be really cool if I had if I found a way to make a costume that I could like be really uh, constrained and at the same time try to uh, uh, perform the trio A, which it, to my understanding, this is like a quintessential like uh, performance piece or dance piece of, of, of modern dance. Um, so I learned it through um, YouTube and I, I decided to do it dressed like this and the idea was to sort of literally uh, do a performance that exemplified what it means to interact with the legacy of, of an important artwork and the weight of it. So the uh, fabric I'm wearing goes up to like a fourth floor and it turned out to be like 50 meters of fabric that I'm like dragging around and twisting and turning and it really made it incredibly difficult to perform. And also I had this big uh, um, platforms and my face was covered with a with a stocking. Um, so a lot of the work I do uh, in uh, always has this sort of like um, reference to an art historic. Not everything I do, but sometimes is really trying to establish dialogues with existing art history works. 
Um, so this was probably one of the first ones that was like really, uh, yeah, I was really doing in a very direct way. Uh, the title, sorry, is no atrioa, so it's negating while at the same time sort of acknowledging the existence of that performance. It's an, it, I'm, I'm thinking about these two works and thinking about also this state of being an artist and, and engaging with these kind of histories and legacies and these kind of difficulties that surround it or even what the situation is that you're in. Um, and how quite literal like, like it can be, you know? I feel like there's, there's always this, uh, in the work, there's always this humor at the same time as there's something that's a lot deeper and more difficult um, that's coming out in this piece too, just being attached to architecture in that way, you know, which is very similar to the way that you were attached to architecture previously and how that environment is also supporting you, but also making things difficult. Yeah, architecture plays a big role in what I do. I usually work very site-specific. I kind of wanted to be an architect. When I was little, I would always tell my dad I was going to be an architect. So I'm very drawn to architecture and spaces, and I tend to um, really situate the work within the space that I'm working. So yeah, it definitely comes from the other the PC for sale piece. And if we can move to the next uh, image, this is also, I think this is actually like one of the first works I saw of yours, which is um, in uh, an exhibition in Los Angeles, I believe, yeah. at Blum and Poe. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the espectaculares, right? Yeah. So the word espectacular is a uh, spectacle, it's in Spanish. And it's definitely, at the time, I was like really into art theory and reading Guy Debord's like uh, Society of the Spectacle. And so how this, it's really a, a play on words on this idea of the spectacle and its relation to consumer culture. And so we call, in Mexico, we call billboards espectaculares. And what you see here is a typical abandoned billboard in Mexico, in the outskirts of Mexico City, where the numbers that you dial to rent the ad get shuffled, because uh, some of them are still hand-painted. It's, it's less common, but it's, they're still around. And I love them, because they're just like these blind spots of consumer identity. It's just like this beautiful, abstract image. So I started like doing versions of them in textile and I would uh, dye and, and sew um, each different panel and, um, and do these really massive textiles that turn out to be more curtains and paintings and also the curtain being kind of a, a, a reference to the spectacle and um, et cetera. It just, uh, every time I would show them, there was a reference of the space as sort of like this um, it had this uh, idea of uh, situating the viewer as, as a more, more a public, a spectator than like, um, yeah, something other, I don't know how to say it, like. I love how slow they are, these textiles yeah. that you make in comparison to how fast the billboards are, you know, and just taking this kind of failure of a, capitalist society and making it into something that's quite intimate and, you know, varied. Yeah, I did a lot of these in my kitchen because I was a new mom and I kept telling my partner, I think my kids are going to think I'm a witch because I'm always by the, like, cauldron, like, <laughs> making, dying things. But, um, yeah, I did, I did a bunch of them and I would, I, at the time I was, the way I work in Mexico is I, I would go around with a camera and just shoot a bunch of things that I, interest me. So I have archives of things, like this is an archive, a photo from the, an archive of the Espectacular series, and I just have like tons of, of these, so I would just like stop in the middle of a highway and just shoot photos of these and, and just do remakes of them. So I did a, a bunch of different um, textiles. Um, that are really just one-to-one -one copies. And then they kind of transformed into things that you could wear, which is in the next yeah. image. 
Uh, if you go to the next image. Also, I have to say, I love when an artist makes a PowerPoint. Like all of these like, like juxtaposed images are, are, are amazing. <laughs> um, so this kind of brought performance into, into these works a bit. Yeah, so the, I showed the curtains in a domestic setting, which was, um, it's really a gallery, but it's a house. And I thought I would just dress the house with curtains. And I decided, I asked my friend, who you see here, uh, Gabriela Jauregui. She's a wonderful uh, poet and author. She recently won the prize for um, a, an amazing novel called Feral, the Beaux-Art Prize of, uh, you know. And she wrote an amazing text that opens the book. And she wrote the text that opens my book. And we've collaborated in many different projects. Um, and for this specific show, we decided to write a script that discussed this sort of idea of a woman that, that lived in a house, but you don't really like see her. And the way that you know that there's someone living in the house is because every time you go to the gallery, the objects are moved. So like the curtains are in a different place or the vases have moved or shifted. And so the script is a, a very nice text where like the characters of the script are like the vases and the curtains. They're the ones that are speaking and they're talking about like how this woman um, treats the vases and the curtains and what she does in the space when, you, when you're not around. And so, uh, yeah, the, it was kind of trying to reimagine re or reconstruct a different idea of, of women in domestic setting. At the time, as I said, I was a, a new mom and I was working from home and I spent a lot of time in my living room, like nursing my kids. And these curtains were literally hanging in like my living room. And uh, so it was nice to reimagine other word, worlds that weren't the, the, the norm, you know, of what you think of a woman when she's uh, in a domestic setting. And the fact that they're made from remnants of consumer culture or what's left from consumer culture was something that attracted me. And so she's wearing a huge kimono that's kind of oversized. She's little, but there she looks tiny because the kimono is really, really big. It's hanging on the sort of the corner of the top image. And I did that kimono with the, all the leftovers. I had all the cutouts of, of my curtains. And so it was a nice robe for her to wear and read the script at the end of the show. And we, we basically enacted the script by moving the, the vases and the curtains um, around. The, these vases were made with that amazing studio in Guadalajara, right? Yeah. Yeah. I never did ceramics before, and this was the first time. So the idea was that I would do like, like these shapes. Um, I made them into vases, really big vases, and I had no idea what I was doing because doing ceramic in geometric shapes is very <laughs> difficult, and they were really big, so it was really hard to do, but. We managed. And uh, in the next image, we have another kind of evolution of this work that was at the Freeze Art Fair, um, which is kind of amazing because in this situation, anyone could wear one of these mm. and, well, they could take and take them home. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, it's a, the project was called Wearing Watching. And I think I met Margot at, at this fair, right? Yeah, I know this is we a story of how I came to know Pia's work. And how so I was pregnant. I was three months pregnant, and I was doing this show. And um, the point of this show was to uh, it. So, wearing watching is I, it's a, a title I took from an essay of Elio Itisica. If you're not familiar with his work, he's a Brazilian artist from the 70s. I'm a total fan of his work. And he did this series of works called Parangoles, which are um, sort of wearable paintings that he would give to people in, in, in the slums of Brazil and have them wear them. And he wrote an essay about the importance of situating the spectator inside the work and actually literally wearing the work. And that that totally transformed the way you perceived art as opposed to seeing it on the wall. And when I was invited or commissioned to do a work for Freeze, I 
I, I've always felt funny about art fairs, even though I totally, you know, I'm, I depend on them to some extent to live and pay my bills. But um, I thought it'd be nice to do something that subverted the idea of the fair. And so uh, I basically set up a stand where I would give out the ponchos for free. And in a fair where everything costs money, it turned out to be, uh, you know, a big deal. <laughs> So uh, we did 800. They were all handmade, and um, I, I did them from remnants of uh, different fabric vendors that I visit in downtown Mexico City. Can we see the next slide, please? What I didn't expect is that, so we had like slots, and we'd say, you know, from two to three, you can come and just pick a poncho and take it home. And the idea was that I would brand Elio Itisica's idea into like a brand. So basically, you know, the, I did the big bags with the W and the ponchos themselves had a big W. So it's starting to use the language of, of, of consumer culture as part of the, the work. And um, basically what ended up happening is that we, we, it was a disaster in the set, but a good disaster, uh, like the lines of people uh, lining up were insane. And the booths next to uh, our booth were starting to complain, like, people can't get through. Like, there's too many people. And what was very beautiful about this project, and also very uh, perverse, is that um, we saw all sorts of behavioral things that uh, so it exemplified anything from like you know people being very generous and happy to be participating and other people using their status or their privilege to get through the lines and saying you know I'll, I'll pay you you know that and I don't want to say this but directors of museums in New York saying like you know if I pay you can I get in the line and I think <laughs> I think it's funny <laughs> that uh, when you are in a context that's, that's um, yeah, promoting art as a commodity, then, you know, these things happen. And this project was a little bit about that. And, and then I asked people to, the only requisite to get one is that you could, I would, I asked them if they could please, when they post a photo, to tag the, the name's project. And so I have a very nice archive of people wearing them in, in just everyday settings. And that was really beautiful to have the work be in everyone's homes or in the beach or in the subway. And, and that was really nice. And here, I feel like there's the start of this, I, what I've talked to Pia about is this rhizomatic nature of your practice in terms of how you often set up these situations, allowing for the public to transform the work. Um, and I think this is also the start of where that became a big part of your work. Um, and oftentimes, you would have an idea or a framework, and the public would completely transform it, which is certainly the case with the project that we did at New Museum. And I think the next slide is that, right? Okay. So if we can go to the next slide. This is the project we did in the lobby gallery of the new museum. And if you haven't been to the museum before, um, this is on the ground floor and is actually open to the public. So the cafe is there and you can see it from the street and people on the street can come in. Um, and there's also this funny relationship because it has this glass wall. It's like this fishbowl quality. So the people that are inside the gallery are being watched by the people in the cafe. The people in the cafe are, are also, like you're watching them as you're going through the gallery. So it has this, also this relationship to wearing watching that's interesting and also just about the environment of New York and how window shopping is just such a part of what it means to walk around the city streets. Um, and this project was called A Pot for a Latch. Um, and uh, I'll kind of let Pia talk a little bit more about it, but um, it, yeah, it, it was a, a little journey that we went on together. Yeah, so uh, after the wearing watching, I got really interested in engaging uh, public participation in the work. And this, this sort of came out after, right after that project, and I, and I read um, this book by Marcel Maus called The Gift. 
and it sort of goes into describing different alternative alternative economies and amongst them sort of the, the potlatch ceremonies of the um, First Nations uh, con uh, uh, tribes in, in the US. And I, I like this idea of like, if, you, if you're given a space in a museum that has this proximity to, you know, the sort of the museum shop and kind of thing, to sort of extend the space to the public and, and have it be a functional space where it was really based on an exchange um, economy. So we did a call out with the public and we said, you know, we're looking for uh, donations of objects that have some significance to you or your life or whatever. And, um, and in exchange, I, I made 100 sweatshirts, which are the ones you see up there or down here, we see a close up of it. So the sweatshirt itself was seen like, I, I, would, I imagine it like a contract. So the sweatshirt reads, exchange certificate for the donation of blank um, by contributor blank, New Museum, New York City. I think that was mine. <laughs> really? No way. Yeah. What? That was mine. That was the first one. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> wow. So, uh, yeah, you would take the sweatshirt home and you would bring an object. And then the museum started a series of exchange dates where you would show up. And if you liked something on the grid, you could just take it as long as you gave an object in return. Um, and they were like inspired by these grid panels that you see all over Mexico City on the streets. Um, and they're these kind of like itinerant carts that transform into these spaces to put like some hats or gloves or cell phones or whatever, you know, mm. on top of these grid panels. But also, of course, like have this relationship to modernism. Um, and that was something I think, you know, we talked a lot about and w went all over Mexico City to look at these. Uh, you know, sources of inspiration. Yeah, I'm really drawn to like uh, makeshift architecture. So it's, uh, this is definitely something that I've also t taken a lot of photos of, the, the ways they set up markets in Mexico City. Um, should we see the next slide? Yeah. <clears throat> so we had these like series of exchange days. And the first one, yeah, I was like, that's what you're, that's an AP. It was like, the, <laughs> I had the, the uh, we had these series of exchange days that we set up in the lobby. And the first one was one where you would bring in an object and you would get a sweatshirt and you would fill out a certificate. And so these are some of the certificates and pictures of the people that came with objects. Um, and it was like, I mean, it was just so interesting to see what people brought. I feel like especially on that first day, there was like a real earnestness to, to, to what people brought. Um, and just like, and yeah, their reasons for the object and how it meant something so much to them. And they like read this, this uh, we, there was like a, a, a call for, for objects that we sent out. And um, Yeah, I specifically like this one that says, um, it's a handmade, handmade scarf, and it reads, uh, the scarf was made from leftover fabric acquired in Budapest that I used to make a skirt for my then husband, who is now transgendered. It was a gesture of love and support uh, for his transgendered interest. <laughs> and so it, they would get really personal like this. And the, I've done this piece in, in different settings. Um, it's, I've done probably four different versions of it in, in different places. And what's turned out to be the, the, the nicest part of this work in retrospect is sort of, or at least for me, the most valuable aspect of the work is, is the archive. Um, so now I think they've exchanged about 500 or so objects or even more, and each object is um, registered and some are really silly like whatever like the cop I got in my first job or whatever but some are really really significant and it's been really nice to build communities through this work um, and if in the next image I think there's one more image of it but one of the things that w relates a lot to what um, you know, we were talking about this like rhizomatic and almost generous quality of the work is just how much it shifted throughout the course of the show. So we held these exchanges on the weekends and we would change the grid system every week. 
Um, and one of the funny things that happened, just as an like a like a off the side of of just working on this project, was that somehow art students became aware <laughs> that they could bring their artwork and have it in, on view at the new museum. <laughs> So it, it like towards the end of the show, and also we had um, myself, but also like other people that were hired to actually accept gifts. Um, and in some instances, like people had to have a really good reason for for why they were bringing this work. And there were some that like would just scribble something on a piece of paper and be like, "I made this." I'd be like, "No, that's not. <laughs> we're not gonna accept that." Um, but it was interesting because there were, you know, there were yeah, there I were all these SVA students. I remember that. <laughs> I think something nice about the piece that I didn't foresee until it happened is that it really started. Uh, getting into the politics of the institution, so how things are, uh, you know, inventoried and to what interest and how it's done and what's considered art and what isn't. And I think what was very nice to, to um, do, and especially with someone like Margot, is that they, they had a total openness to sort of discuss these things and it sort of allowed the work to exist in that setting. Um, yeah. I also want to give a shout out to Pia and artist moms in particular because she came to install the show with a four year old and a, I think she was w almost two months, one month yeah. year old daughter. And that was challenging. Um, it was funny, I had this kind of reputation at New Museum of working with a lot of babies because a lot of women that I was working with had babies in the time. But it was also um, just, it, it was interesting because it was, it, it was like, it was amazing, like even to, you know, be able to do this project with Pia and knowing that like, she was about to have this child and being like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna get this done. Yeah, I don't advise it at all. It's not something I'm proud of, but I did do it. And uh, it was very funny because I was like changing my daughter's diapers in the tables of the lobby. And I remember the director coming and doing this face like, is this, is she meant to be doing this? I was like, fuck yeah, like, I'm not gonna be like installing, then running to the bathroom to change her, coming back, like I was like, I just birthed like three weeks ago. So it's like, I'm not gonna fucking do that. <laughs> um, but also I was pregnant, and then I wasn't was pregnant. anyone at the time because it was fresh, but I was like, can I change the diaper? It was like... <laughs> and what I wanna say is, I don't even know if you care about this, but our daughters just met this like two weeks ago for the first time and it was the most beautiful thing because we told them like you, you guys met way before you knew like uh, so it was a very and they they became really good friends no yeah yeah super it's, cute uh, yeah they hit it off it was amazing yeah, yeah. Um, okay so we move to the next one um, ooh this relates a lot to what you were saying about using the remnants which uh, in, especially like to make the uh, spectacular that you were doing earlier, um, but mm -hmm. how that relates to this fast fashion. Yeah, so I, I, as I said, I love markets and this specifically is a market I adore. It's called Las Torres and it's as far as your eyes can see in the outskirts of Mexico, there's just like piles and piles and pl piles of clothes. Um, most, or if not all, of these clothes comes from the U.S. Um, it, uh, but however, it gets made in sweatshops in uh, Latin America, majoritively. Majoritively, um, so I got really interested in sort of the history of these uh, of these clothing, just how it really became uh, uh, sort of. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Like this uh, currency that 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 um, described very well the the bilateral relations between Mexico and the U.S. Both for its like uh, you know um, formal and in informal as aspect, how it spoke also about like the 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 intrinsic relation that is built on like both legal and illegal relations, because most of this. Uh, uh, works get brought back to Mexico through the cartel um, 
uh, networks because uh, importation taxes are so high and it's one of the m most uh, competitive industries in Mexico, the textile industry. So I started doing, uh, I started going there and I love it because it's like being in like in a pirate ship because it's not these big tarps um, that you see on the bottom, they extend, as, as I said, as far as the eye can see, but they're set up in one day. Like at, if you go there at 4 a.m. in the morning, they're setting it up. And then by 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they're gone. And um, and the way they operate and how this economy exists is remarkable. And it's one of the most competitive industries to the formal uh, textile industry in Mexico. So I, uh, it's just sort of a, a work that I, I did a lot. Also, the tianguis is, uh, you know, in, it's, it's a notion that goes back to pre-Hispanic times. That's a word that's not uh, from Spanish language. And it's very uh, specific to every neighborhood in Mexico. So I love when I fly into Mexico City that I always see these sort of colored um, roads. And that means that there's a tianguis there. And um, so I did a, a remake of it with these t-shirts that I got from the market. And, and the piece is called Bara Bara Bara, which is Bara is the word for cheap or barato. And that's the cry that the vendors yell when you go into the market, you hear like Bara 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 Pasele Bara Bara. So it's like, that's the name of the word. But it also references an artwork, this piece too. Ah, yeah. True. So I've, I've done a bunch of different versions of them. Sometimes I hang them like tarps. Sometimes I, people wear them out in the fashion of Ligia Pape, who's a, also a Brazilian artist who I adore. She's an artist from the 60s and 70s, and she did this very famous piece that you probably know, or if you don't know, it's called Divisor, and it was a white sheet that people poked their heads through, and it was a very political piece that um, talked about sort of the the importance of the individual in relation to a collective during the dictatorship of Brazil. And so, I yeah. I think in the next image we have a piece. Uh, the Maybe, image yeah. Is, yeah. This is at the Guggenheim. Yeah, so this is another remake of art history, but I called it Divisor Pirata. So it's like a pirate version of Divisor. And to my understanding, the new collective is really, it's not a white sheet. Where I think the, the society that we live in now is very, sort of contradictory and problem, it's kind of like uh, problematized, if that's even a word, by, you know, uh, the, the, the society that, that we are today, which is, to me, this is a little bit more of a, an, an example of, of what we are, which is this sort of a, a complex language of different logos, corporations, identities, um, uh, trade economies, migration stories. Um, and so this piece particularly celebrated the 80 years of the Guggenheim Museum. And it was a performance piece where we unrolled this big sun and the piece is called Here Comes the Sun. And so while we were doing it, um, the top, where, where the blue line is, is a, a, a line of kids. It was a choir of 40 kids from the from a primary school in Harlem, and they were singing the a cappella version of Here Comes the Sun. So as you come in, it was meant to evoke this uh, kind of celestial thing, which I think Frank Lloyd Wright at the time made reference to the natural elements and the importance of the sun in his architecture. And in my, in my perspective, this piece really, uh, the idea was that it brought uh, the, literally the sun, or sh sh it was shining the sun into uh, the, the immigration, um, different immigration communities in, the, in New York. So I worked very closely with, with different communities in Queens and Harlem of, of immigrants and I asked them to donate a work. Can we see the next slide, please, Eliana? Are we doing okay with time? Yeah, I was wondering that too. Cinco minutos. Okay. Well, we should go. <laughs> okay, so basically they donated a t-shirt in exchange they would get um, passes to the institution and metro cards and the idea was that they, 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 they would 
go to and participate in the institution and then with together with the institution we we started talking about um, diversifying their public and into bilingual um, publics and have them uh, go on a, on a on a you know more regular basis um, and on the left you see uh, Biki with the white hair she's uh, as, um, she's just the my a great great friend and and um, a remarkable seamstress and I've been working with her for the past 10 years and we've established a very close relationship she's there with her nieces because we have five minutes, I feel like we should fast forward a little bit yeah. to the most recent Let's show. Fast forward. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very special piece, though. Yeah. This is one that you, a kid walks into a room with these and is like something Amelie. unreal. <laughs> yeah. It's called Blue Geniando, and it's also done from secondhand jeans, and they're just basically sewn together. And it's a very interactive piece, but it's also a little bit perverse and macabre because it kind of looks like bodies. And again, it does have reference to bodies crossing the border, and, but it's, you access that through play, which is something that I've been doing that in my work. So the next slide, I think, is an image of the most recent exhibition that I was talking about in the beginning. That's it. I think it closed recently, but it was on view in Mexico opened in February of this year. Um, and it was quite a special exhibition because, especially for someone who was familiar with your work, because it remixed and, and brought together like so much of your practice from the early flyers from your band that I was talking about before to this uh, very recent work, which is in the foreground here, and also included this very kind of uh, more unusual form of architecture, which was quite special. So the show is called Fuego Amigo, or Friendly Fires, which is the same name as, as the book. The name, uh, we gave it to the book even uh, before the show happened, or before this very tragic event happened about a year ago, where my studio uh, was caught on fire, and I just lost my entire studio and, and everything in it. And so, I was able to rescue the beams of the space. It's a, it was a small space, but I had built it. I, I moved to the country with my kids, and um, I had built it in this idea that the space would be um, sustainable and in, in dialogue with, with nature, but I didn't realize how in dialogue in nature it would end up being. Because fire turned out to be an important, very important uh, collaborator, and um, so the beams, the black beams, are the burnt, um, the burnt uh, beams studio. from my studio. So I, I built, I, I designed these structures, and all the work, and it included pieces like this one, which is um, an image from 2000. So. 24 years ago that I took, uh, it was a project I was doing in the streets of Rome. I used to live in Rome. And um, it, it included things like that, like very, very old work to the present, which is that this piece is called um, the tree that gives, it is the tree that gives shelter. And it's really the remains of all my studio, including my dad's ashes, because uh, he passed away in 2020 and his ashes were in my studio. So it's kind of a homage to him and the seeing sort of the, 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 the studio as sort of like a, um, yeah, like an, uh, what the fuck is that word? Like a offering to him. And um, so that was at the center, and then the, these structures were sort of going around, and it, they provided a very nice sort of like coming and going in the gallery. You know, you could sort of be inside the circle or outside the circle. It was all these like amazing. Can we see the next slide? <clears throat> juxtapositions, quite like this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> like, you would go look through one image and see something else, and this. I think it's really special also at this point of an artist's career to like be able to 
do that with your practice, like play with it a bit in terms of like mm. what you can see through one thing into the next? Yeah, so we, I, I purposefully left the, the walls of the museum uh, bare like this so that they don't have the white paint. And the idea was to sort of dismantle the museum and see it in its bare form. And uh, I, you also had like really wall-sized photos that he, this is a photo of my, one of my studios in Mexico that used to be an old cabaret and we would ho hold um, cabaret nights every three weeks. And then I would have like video projections, like that's like the trio A performance that you saw at the beginning of the presentation and you know, like furniture to sit on. And yeah, it was kind of like very sort of all sorts of different things. And um, this was also kind of at the launch of this amazing book, uh, Friendly Fires. Uh, with, was kind of it, everything culminated with, with this show and this book at the same time. Um, and I wanted to ask a bit about Friendly. About Friendly? <laughs> like, like, obviously, it, you, you mentioned the fire being quite devastating. Yeah, but, it was devastating. But uh, uh, it's also very transformative and very insightful and it sort of allowed me to um, really things, see things from a different place. And at that point, um, and the aftermath of that, I realized uh, the true transformative power, power of fire. And I, and I, without trying to be like romantic or whatever, really understanding it as a collaborator. And in the natural world, fire tends to be a collaborator to, to the, you know, the furthering of life. Um, natural fires are very typical, which just now with global warming, they're getting out of hand and we should probably start doing something about it like they used to do in the old days where they would, you know, control their own fires, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I've gotten a lot into uh, ideas of, uh, well, now that I live in the country, uh, I have a, a project that's um, really trying to learn and sort of understand um, how to have a more sustainable living. And so I have a ranch where I've learned a bunch of different techniques of agroforestry and water management. And so yeah, this, these are things that I'm very interested in right now. And so for sure the, the fire became sort of a very important collaborator in my work. In the next image, I think we might have some pictures of the, the catalog, which is really so special. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, I feel like it has all of these elements, not just in terms of like the, the, ma the amazing essays and like what they present on your practice, but in terms of the design. And I loved seeing yeah. Gabriella's piece open it up. I was remembering she also wrote for our show, we did a brochure. And she did ah, this yeah, poem she did a poster. It. Do you remember? Very She's just a remarkable author, and she wrote the, the entire first, the intro of the book. That's uh, if you have a chance to see it when you leave. It's sort of like a text that, in the background, there's images from my archives, and in the forefront is her text. Um, and then it, it's just this comprehensive monograph with like about, I think, covers about 32 projects that I've done in the past like 15 years. And then it has like texts by authors and collaborators that I've been working with um, repeatedly throughout the years. And collaboration is a very important aspect of my work and the entire book is sort of based on that principle. And so it includes all sorts of imagery from very official to very personal. Here's the cabaret I was mentioning. Um, so it, most of this is photos that we would take during the, the parties. Um, that's the band. This is the studio. Um, so it's, for me, it's a joy to see my work like this because it's a project that I, I, I did um, pretty much single-handedly at the beginning because a curator asked me if there was any texts about my work and I said, well, no, there isn't any. And I was old enough to maybe start thinking about it. So we tried to get some money together and it took us about five years to get this book out and going. And so it's a, a, a project I'm very proud of. I'm very happy that it exists and I'm very happy that 
I, I was able to do it with a wonderful team. Um, Sophia Broy designed it. She's a very close friend of mine and a wonderful designer, so it was very fun to work with her. I feel like you have worked with a lot of people over very long periods, which is really, I think, quite special. Yeah, I don't, I, we didn't talk about this much here, but, and, and I'm probably gonna try to finish it with that, but the importance of sort of gen, generating um, 